everyone. Welcome to Spring Hill Church. I'm Pastor Brad Mullins, and I am so grateful that you have taken your time to spend with us today for our online worship service. We're going to have a great time in the Word of God and in the presence of God. And I don't know about you, but I came ready to receive today. I believe God has something for each and every one of us, and He wants to speak to you and to me to cause our lives to be different. And I don't know about you, but I uh, I welcome change and, and I'm learning how to welcome it more and more, but especially where the goodness of God is concerned. You know, God only wants good things for each and every one of us. And so when he brings change into our lives, it's only for our betterment to, to better our lives, to help us to be better people, to become more like Jesus, and then to experience all the good things that he has in store for us. So we want you to know we love you. We appreciate each and every one of you. And as I said, I believe we're going to have an awesome time today. Before we go any further, I want to open our service together in prayer. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you so much for our church family and our friends that are joining us today. Father, we come boldly into your presence, thanking you for your goodness and your faithfulness. And Father, I thank you that we can approach you and receive what you have in store for each and every one of us. Father, we thank you, Lord, for strengthening us. We thank you, Father, for us to lead this time together with more faith, more joy, more of your peace on the inside of us. And Father, thanking you for the victory that is in store for the upright, and that's each and every one of us. And we praise you for it today. Father, I believe you for miracles. I believe you for healings. I believe you, Father, for people to be born again today, people to recommit their lives to you. And Father, we believe it. We thank you for it in advance, and we give you praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Again, thank you so much for spending your time with us today. As we do every week, we're going to take the first few moments of our time together, about 15 minutes, and we're going to worship. And uh, I'm grateful for the ministries that made worship sets available to us. And, you know, throughout this whole time that we've been going through the pandemic and then through this window of time where we're in between locations, and uh, it's helped us to be able to have some worship music. And so I'm very, very grateful for that. And I just want to encourage you, use this as a vehicle. Let the music, let the words carry you into the presence of God and to help you focus your attention on Him so that you can enter into His presence. And you know, we say it all the time around here at Spring Hill, and that is this. It is impossible for you and me to come into the presence of God, have a meeting with Him, and then leave the same way we came in. I believe to be different, and I hope you're believing that for yourself as well. But we're going to take the first few moments of our time, and we're going to worship God, and then we'll be right back with today's message. Again, we can hardly wait. Come flood this place. We're ready now. It's all about to change. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done. Let your fire fall. Let your fire fall. Open the
what was dead now comes away every captive breaking free right now right now right now yeah darkness trail
his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. 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 The Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn. Why? Why did Jesus come to earth? 
why forsake the majesty and fellowship of heaven? Exchanging a palace for a stable. Immortal comforts for a feeding trough. And robes of glory for the feeble body of an infant. An unparalleled irony, this supreme, unrivaled nobility experiencing absolute and total humility. Our sovereign God, Emmanuel, as a baby. He didn't come to heap shame upon sinners or to judge and cast out the impious, but to break bread with those called unrighteous. He didn't come to illuminate every mystery of the cosmos or to enlighten the intellectual, but to fulfill the testimony of prophets clothed in rags. He didn't come to elevate a single nation or to advocate a particular political affiliation. He came because he saw you broken in need of salvation. He saw you lost and abandoned crying out, surrounded by deaf ears, fighting through the tears, but beaten down by the torments of this world. And unable to bear your distress, he renounced his eternal throne, walked the earth, bore the stripes, accepted the nails, and gave up his last breath, so that you could receive the breath of life. Our holy, infinite God beheld your pain, perceived your heart, and determined that your soul was worth dying for. From the manger, to the cross, to the empty tomb, it is all a story of profound love, of a Savior who rescued his children from darkness of a blameless king who declared that no sacrifice was too great for the sake of his beloved creation. Why did Jesus come to earth? He came for you. This is part three of our series called Renew, and I am very excited about this series because I believe the Lord laid it on my heart to share these things with you because I believe this is key in you and me experiencing significant life change and to allow God to do something in our lives to help us to become more like Him, to experience the quality of life that He has in store for each and every one of us. And, and all of that has to do with where we're headed in this series. And so I want to remind you, go back and review the first two parts of this series, and you can do that on our website. Download the message notes. All of my notes are available for you on the website. You can download them at springhill.cc and uh, study those things out, get them down in your heart. You know, you can't get it just by hearing it one time. The scripture says in Romans 10, 17, that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And that hearing is actually in the continuous sense. It doesn't say faith comes by having heard. So faith comes by hearing and hearing on a continuous sense what God's word has to say. So I want to hit on a couple of high points that we've mentioned in the previous two parts. And uh, again, these are all in the notes. So if you miss anything, because I go quickly through this little review part, don't worry about it. You can get it online. But I want to say this to you. Our greatest challenge as Christians is to change our thinking and thus change our behavior. It's not an issue of needing more faith. It's not an issue of trying to get our flesh under. No, it's all about changing our thinking and then changing 
our behavior. Now, we also said your victory in this life will follow your right decisions and your right behavior. So when we learn how to make decisions that are in line with God's word and we follow what the word says and uh, change our thinking to come in line with that, then our behavior will follow that corrected thinking. So you can change defeat into victory by changing your behavior and you can change your behavior by changing your mind. Now, we talked about thinking a little bit. We talked about your mind. And here's something that I want to, again, say to you, and that is this. Your spirit, if you're a believer, if you have given your heart to Jesus and you're a follower of him today, then your spirit is brand new. Your spirit is alive unto God. And as we've talked about that, you know, we have to do something with our minds and we have to do something with our flesh, with God's help, of course. But... I pointed out to you, and that is this, that the supernatural power of God in us can never rise above the ceiling to which our mind comes into agreement with our born again spirit. Meaning if your mind is constantly fighting your recreated spirit, then it's going to be a struggle and you're never going to go any higher than that point. We also said this, that we have no limitation in this life except what our mind sells us based on how we see our lives. And we're going to talk more about that today. Now, the big point, a main point of this whole series is that, that the Christian life, being a Christian, is not about behavior modification. It's not about you and me, oh, just mustering up enough strength and courage and changing our behavior and forcing ourselves. No, we need to change our behavior, but it's not behavior modification. The Word teaches us that it takes something different in order to change our behavior. So let's look at uh, kind of our foundation scripture for this series found in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 and the, in the Passion Translation. And so let me read this to you. Verse 1 says this, Beloved friends, what should be our proper response to God's marvelous mercies? I encourage you to surrender yourselves, your bodies, to be his sacred, to God, to be his sacred living sacrifices and live in holiness, experiencing all that delights his heart. For this becomes your genuine expression of worship. Verse 2, and this is the key. Stop imitating the ideals and opinions of the culture around you, but be inwardly, get this, transformed by the Holy Spirit through a total reformation of how you think. This will empower you to discern God's will as you live a beautiful life, satisfying and perfect in His eyes. And we mentioned to you that the word transformed in verse 2 is actually the Greek word that we get our English word metamorphosis from, meaning changing of the form or nature of a thing or person into a completely different one by natural or supernatural means. And so what Paul is telling us in these two verses is that God is interested in something supernatural happening on the inside of us that changes us on the outside. So behavior modification is all about uh, trying to change from the outside in. God is more interested in a transformation taking place to where we change our behavior from the inside out. And he says the way that we do that is we are transformed by the Holy Spirit through a reformation, a reformation of how we think. And so the Bible is very clear in teaching us that the way we change is by changing the way that we think. Now, some translations say renew the mind. Now, and this is all part of the process. It's renewing, reforming, it's changing our thinking to line up with God and His Word. And in doing that, that's when our behavior will follow suit.
So if there are behaviors and habits and things like that in our lives, they can be changed or even eliminated by changing the way that we think. And so last week we went to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5, and we looked at Paul's breakdown there of how we think, how we deal with thought as human beings, the way God created us. And so let's touch on these uh, three verses here. For in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 3, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. I am so thankful that, yeah, we're dealing with the flesh, we're dealing with natural carnal things, but thank God, God didn't leave us with natural fleshly carnal resources to have to deal with those areas of our lives, that he gave us the opportunity. The scripture goes on to say in verse four, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, fleshly, natural, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Now, last week we broke this down and we backed into this verse and in verse five, and we see how Paul builds this. And we see in these scriptures, the three levels of mental activity, three levels of thinking that we all engage in. So I'm going to back into this verse, just like Paul did, or, or, or like he did in his structure. And so in the last part of verse five, we see that we bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So the first level of mental activity that we all deal with is in our thoughts, simple thoughts. And we talked about how important this is because thoughts are the building blocks of our lives. And we said this, that you determine, you and I determine the thoughts that we either accept, we take, or we reject. And Jesus told us in Matthew chapter six that we have the ability to refuse a thought or to take a thought. And so how do we take a thought? Well, Jesus said also in that same chapter in Matthew six, that we take a thought by putting words to it. We put words to that thought and we begin to speak it and talk about it. And then that thought takes on a life of its own. It, it, it begins to build and become something else. And so then the next level of mental activity that Paul gives us in the beginning of verse five, he says, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. So as we, as we have thoughts and we allow those thoughts and we put words to them and we take them and allow them to be built upon each other, we think in pictures. And what we begin to do is we begin to build a picture of whatever it is that we're dealing with at the moment and that becomes and imagination. So you take a thought by saying it, you put words to it. Now, Paul also told us in that last part of that verse, he said, take every thought captive. And so the, we make thoughts obey by speaking God's word, which is contrary to that thought, if it's contrary to the word. So let me illustrate this for you. Uh, let's just use something very, very basic. As a born again believer, the scripture says that we are a new creation in Christ, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Well, you know, all of us have the opportunity to think thoughts of, you know, how jacked up, how messed up our lives are. And it's, you know, that I'm still a mess. I must still be a sinner. I must still be, uh, you know, without God. And, and, you know, sometimes we don't feel saved. Well, as those thoughts enter our thinking, if we put words to them, if we put them in our mouths and we begin to speak them, then those words, those thoughts rather, take on a life of their own. And then one thought will lead to another thought. And then we begin to build this thing called an imagination. 
So the way that we address those thoughts and you capture those thoughts before they ever get to the imagination part is that you have to open your mouth and speak the word contrary to that thought. Let me say it to you this way. Jesus said we take a thought by saying it. Well, you reject a thought exactly the same way, by saying something. So when those thoughts of I'm unworthy, I must just be a sinner, I keep failing and messing up. No, what you have to do when that thought comes into your mind, the way you take it captive is you open your mouth and you say something that's contrary to that negative thought. No, use the verse we just talked about, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. No, the Bible says, I am a new creation in Christ. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. It is impossible for me to be a sinner because I am a new creation in Christ. Later on in that same chapter in 2 Corinthians 5, Paul goes on to say that we have been made the righteousness of God in Christ. See, you were a sinner, but you got saved. The blood of Jesus cleansed you from all sin, and so now you're not a sinner. You might sin, but you're not a sinner, and then you are the righteousness of God. So what do I have to do? When that thought crosses my mind, I'm just a sinner. No, I am the righteousness of God. I am right in God's eyes. Sin has been washed away, cleansed from me, and it's as though I stand in the presence of God as though sin never existed. See, I have opened my mouth, I've put words in my mouth, and I have rejected that thought that told me something contrary to the Word of God. Now, let's go back to this. As I mentioned to you, the first part of verse 5 in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 10 says that we cast down imagination. So, again, backing into this, as we accept those thoughts, we begin to build those mental images. Now, as we build those Im mental images, and the more we think about it, the more we talk about it, the more we imagine it, then it can have the potential to become what Paul said in the, the, the part of verse 4, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Those, those imaginations become a fortification in your life. Let me, let me illustrate this for you. Let's say somebody has offended you and, and made you mad about something and you know you're going to have a conversation with them. Well, you know, I've done this and I'm sure you probably have too, that person at work that gets on your nerves and, you know, you're standing there getting ready for work that day and, you know, your mind begins to think about those things and the next thing you know, you're imagining how that confrontation is going to go. Well, you know, when I walk into work today, if they say one thing to me, then I'm going to let them have it. You know, they might say good morning and I might just unload on them. <laughs> and so what happens is we have thought that we might even speak it. And then we imagine that process. Well, if if I do that, they're probably going to respond this way. And if they respond that way, then I'm going to respond this way. I'm going to say this and then they'll probably say this and then I'm going to respond this way and I'm going to say this. And before you know it, you have imagined that whole conversation going one way. And uh, here's what's so dangerous about this. And I'm going to kind of let the cat out of the bag, so to speak. You'll be surprised at how when you get to work, because that's the way you saw it, you thought about it, you imagined it, and you began to build that stronghold in your thinking, that what happens is you'll unconsciously or subconsciously say something and cause that scenario to go in that direction. And you don't even realize it. And so it's all because of those building blocks of thought, imaginations that build into strongholds. So I want to build this again. We talked about thoughts and taking thoughts last week. This week, I want to talk to you about that next level, imaginations. You know, I mentioned to you uh, last week that we don't think in words, we think in pictures. 
You know, if I say a word to you, you don't think the letters that make up that word. No, you think in pictures. And God created us that way. That's not something that came about because of the fall of man. That came about because God wired us that way on purpose, by the way. He designed us to be able to function that way. So the, the second level of our mental activity or our thinking, our thinking is our imagination. Now I looked up the word imagination in the dictionary and here's what it says. The forming of mental images of what is not actually present to the senses. I'm gonna say that to you again. The forming of mental images of what is not actually present to the senses. We begin to imagine those things that, that we're not even experiencing yet in the natural realm, but we uh, um, begin to imagine it in our thinking with those pictures and we build those blocks of images in our thinking and form those imaginations. So in other words, our imagination was given to us by God so that, get this, so that we could see things that have not yet happened in our lives. Now, since the fall of man, God gave us that ability, but since the fall of man and because of sin entering into the world, we use this in the negative. We, we default and use it in the negative, but God gave us this ability of our imagination so that we could use it in the positive, that we could use it to work in conjunction with our spirit man and begin to see our lives being lived out according to the way God wants our lives being lived out. So listen to this. I, I got this definition from someone. Your imagination is your ability to see with your heart what you can't see with your eyes. Your imagination is your ability to see with your heart what you can't see with, with your eyes. Now, if, if you're like me, you remember being a, a kid in, in school, and I had a tendency to daydream some, and uh, you know, you'd, you'd kind of drift off the teachers talking, and, and you'd kind of drift off and begin to imagine some things, and, and uh, you know, the, the, the crazy thing about it is we almost discourage using our imagination. Now, granted, you should do it at the appropriate time. When your teacher's talking to you, maybe isn't the appropriate time to, to daydream. But you know, a lot of times we discourage, especially young people, to not use their creative imagination to, you know, we, we want them to think within a, a box called reality all the time. And listen, let me say this to you. These terms might sound like something that somebody came up with outside of the Bible, but these things are all godly biblical principles. They're not new agey and we've brought it into the church. No, they took stuff from us and tried using it outside of the church, outside of the parameters that God intended for it to be. But here's my point. We very often discourage people from using their imaginations in the positive, using their imaginations to be creative, to think outside of the box. You know, if you think about this, the people that have really done things in this world, you know, especially uh, the creators, the inventors, uh, you know, they are the ones that did not a limit uh, or limit rather their imaginations to fit within a certain parameter. In other words, if they, they believed that if they could imagine something coming into existence, uh, that invention, then if they had the right amount of people and resources, they could make it happen. You know, Steve Jobs and, and Apple. You know, I'm recording this on a, a device that Apple created. And you know, what if he had never, and their team had never gotten together and thought and imagined outside of the box, it, you know, we'd still be using VHS tapes or, or something even more antiquated than that. No, it takes people being willing to use what God gave them, their imagination, 
thinking about it and letting their thinking build pictures in the positive so that they can bring into existence what they are seeing. So again, your imagination is your ability to see with your heart what you can't see with your eyes. Now, I, I, I want to say this to you. God uses his imagination all the time. You and I are a result of the imagine, imagination of God. In other words, God thought about us and imagined us a long time before we ever came into being. And the Bible says before the foundation of the world, he created a plan for us. In other words, he saw our lives go in a certain way, experiencing him a certain way and in his goodness. And, uh, you know, he uses his imagination all the time. And so he simply is wanting us to learn how to operate in these principles so that we can use the way he wired us for uh, our lives to pursue after him and his will, plan, and purpose instead of against him. So whether you realize it or not, whether you know it or not, your imagination is dictating how your life goes. That's big. Now, I want to take you to Genesis, the 11th chapter, and I want to read you the first verse and then the fourth through the sixth verses in that 11th chapter of Genesis, and I'm going to read it to you out of the Amplified. Now, let me give you a little background so you have an idea as to what's going on. Of course, this is well after man has sinned and the earth is, has sunk into deep darkness. People are, are becoming more and more wicked all the time. And uh, so they, they had made the decision, these, these group of peoples came together and they decided that they were going to get to heaven and to God their way instead of God's way. So they made up their mind that they were going to build this tower called the Tower of Babel in order to be able to get to heaven. And so look at verse one. And again, I'm reading from the Amplified. It says, and the whole earth was of one language, they all spoke the same thing, and of one accent and mode of expression. In other words, their method of communication was all the same. And verse four, and they said, come, let us build us a city and a tower whose top reaches into the sky, and let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered over the whole earth. Now this was all about pride. They said, let us make a name for ourselves. In verse five, and the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, behold, or look, they are one people, they're unified, and they all have one language, and this is only the beginning of what they will do. Now here's what I want you to see, this last phrase in verse six. And now nothing they have imagined they can do will be impossible for them. Man, did you get that? God himself said these people are unified. They have the same language. They're thinking the same. They're speaking the same. And he said that there is nothing they have imagined they can do that will be impossible for them. Now, I want to just mention this and get you to be thinking about this. God's plan has, has still always been the same. If you think about it, that the Bible says that in the book of Acts, in the, the, the early days of the church, the scripture says that they thought the same, they spoke the same, and God knew by the Holy Spirit, if he could get them to imagine the same thing, there is nothing that could be impossible with them. And the same thing is true for you and me today. If, if, you know, within ourselves, if we can think in line with God's word, if we can speak in line with God's word, and, and our imagination is in line with God's word, then there's nothing that can be impossible for you and for me. So why is this so very important? Why are we taking the time to talk about this? In the scriptures, we use a word interchangeably, or there is a word in the Bible that we use interchangeably with imagination. And it is the word hope, H-O-P-E. And hope, if you look it up in the dictionary, 
means an expectation. Now you can't expect something that you don't imagine. <laughs> you ever thought about that? You know, if you uh, know something is going to happen and you're expecting it to happen, I guarantee you, your imagination has already gone to work building pictures of how your life is going to be lived out according to that that you're hoping for. Now, in his article called The Power of Hope, Andrew Womack said this, and I want to read this to you. Hope is more powerful than people realize. Something the Lord shared with me, this is him talking, that really made this truth come alive is this, that hope is a positive imagination. Your imagination is like soil. Soil doesn't care what kind of seed you plant in it. The moment it's planted, the soil starts producing. It's the same thing with your heart and your imagination. Your imagination will conceive something and automatically start making it come to pass, whether it's positive or negative. It's like your spiritual womb, if you will. I love that. I, I like how he articulates that. You know, soil, he says, doesn't care what kind of seed you plant in it. It's just designed to produce that seed. Well, it's the same thing with your heart and your imagination or your expectation. You know, when you expect something, when you begin to imagine it, when you begin to see it, that seed will get planted down in your heart and your heart is designed to cause that thing to come to pass. Now, you and I get to choose whether your imagination is positive, which is hope, or negative, which becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Man, that's something. Think about that. You get the, the, the privilege of, of using your imagination to build expectancy, to build hope, or you can use it in the negative to where it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy because your heart is designed to cause what you hope, what you imagine to get down in your heart and to come to pass. Now your imagine in and of, your imagination rather in and of itself isn't moral or immoral. It's what you focus your attention on that determines whether it is good or bad. So Luke chapter 21 verses in, in verse 26 talking about the hard attitudes and what will be going on and as we approach the end times and see if this doesn't sound familiar. Jesus was telling the disciples what it's going to be like when the end of the age is coming. And Jesus said that men's hearts will fail them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth. Think about that. People are going to, things are going to get bad as they already are. And people begin to imagine it getting worse. They begin to expect those things to get worse and it causes their hearts, their physical hearts to fail them all because of what they're expecting to happen. This is powerful. Isaiah 26, three it says this, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Now, if you get a Strong's concordance out and you look up the word mind in Isaiah 26, three, it's going to, it's going to amaze you because that word mind is actually the Hebrew word for imagination. Think about that. Let me use that. You will keep him. God will keep him in perfect peace whose imagination is stayed on him because he trusts in you. You build an expectation for your life based on your imagination. So if my imagination is focused on the Lord and what his word says and what he has promised, then he's going to keep me in perfect peace. You know, I, I'll be honest with you. The times that I get worried and anxious and agitated are the times when I'm thinking and imagining my life being lived out separately or different than what the word of God says. You know, in this pandemic that we're living in, and I'm not making light of anybody 
that has gotten COVID-19. I, I, I've been aware of plenty of people that have gotten COVID-19. But here's what you, you, you can't do is allow fear to grip your thinking. And so your mind goes and begins to see your life being lived out if you had COVID-19. And when you begin to imagine that and build that expectation in your heart, guess what's going to happen? You're probably going to get COVID-19. But when we take God's word and his word says, who in his own self bore our sins in his own body on the tree, 1 Peter 2, 24, that who in his own self bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live under righteousness and by whose stripes you were healed. Galatians 3.13, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having been made a curse for us. For it's written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Jesus has redeemed me from the curse. No, see, build your imagination on being free from the curse. By the way, COVID-19 is under the curse. So imagine your life being lived out healed and whole and not under COVID-19. Now, if you've had COVID-19, there's no condemnation on you. Receive your healing today and begin to walk in your healing and see yourself healed and whole in Jesus' name. Now, you must stay in God's word and let it dominate you or the unbelief of this world will extinguish your positive imagination. Now, when you begin to build your imagination on the Word of God, you find out in the Word of God, my God shall supply all your need according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And you see your life being lived out as though all of your needs are met and that you have more than enough and you can be a blessing to people around you. You're going to have to continue to feed that. That's not a one-time thing. You're going to have to feed that with the Word of God. Otherwise, what's going to happen is the world through unbelief and just navigating through this life is going to begin to try and extinguish that imagination that you've built in line with God's word. And so you've got to be aware of that. You've got to get in the word of God, feed your imagination. Can I say it to you this way? Feed your faith with the word of God. Think about this. If hope is our positive, expectant imagination in God's word. Hebrews 11, one says faith is the substance of things hoped for. You got to feed your faith on, and, and, and on God's word and build that expectation in your life and not let the world choke it out. Don't let it die. Keep feeding it the word of God, putting your words to it. And, and let it take on life in your heart and in your, your natural life. Now, let's say you, you know, have been dealing with negative pictures, bad imagination in your life. So how do I change the picture? Well, let's go to a scripture in the Old Testament, Joshua chapter 1 in verse 8. Now Moses has died and turned over the leadership of the children of Israel over to Joshua and so Joshua has a daunting, humongous task ahead of him that he has got to, he's got to be able to see not only himself as a strong leader, but he's got to see that God has given them the land, that God is their, their, their warrior. He will fight their battles for them. And he has got to build that into his heart. And uh, so God tells him in Joshua chapter one and verse eight, along with many times telling him, be strong and of good courage. He says this, the book of, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. Now, what's interesting about this word is the Hebrew word that's translated meditate in this verse is translated something else in Psalm chapter two and verse one. In the Amplified Bible, Psalm two verse one says, why do the nations assemble with commotion, uproar and confusion of voices 
And why do the people imagine, meditate upon, and devise an empty scheme? So we see in Psalm 2.1, the same word that's translated meditate in Joshua 1.8 is the Hebrew word for imagine. So God is telling Joshua, he said, the word of God shall not depart from your mouth. Let it stay in your mouth all the time, but you shall imagine it day and night that you may see or observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. Now I want you to understand something. This is something we have to initiate. Notice what God's instructions were. He didn't say, hey, Joshua, you just think whatever you're going to think. You just imagine whatever you want to imagine. I'll take care of it and just kind of straighten out your thinking. No, he said, you are going to have to make up your mind that this word is not going to depart out of your mouth, but you're going to imagine it day and night so that you can see your life being lived out in light of that word, and then you'll make your way prosperous. And one translation says, and then you'll deal wisely in the affairs of life. Folks, it is up to us to imagine our lives being lived out according to the word of God. So what do we do? Well, we take the scripture, And we begin to think about that scripture. And and listen, I want to encourage you to do something. Take time every day. Start just a couple of minutes every day. And I want you to get a verse from the Bible that, you know, whether it's a verse about God's blessing on our lives, his favor upon our lives, the healing that Jesus bought and paid for. Maybe, you know, you're struggling with some sin in your life. You need to see yourself as delivered from that sin, the power of that sin over you broken. So begin to imagine your life being lived out as though that sin does not have power over you. Because that's exactly what Romans chapter 6 tells us. Sin shall not have dominion over you. So see your life being lived out. Take some time and see your life being lived out free from that sin. Begin and, and, and put that on your mouth. Put that in your mouth, rather. Say it. I am not a slave to that sin. I am free from that sin in Jesus' name. And see yourself living a holy life because of what Jesus has done in you and for you. And man, begin to build that picture. Psalm 1, verses 1 and 2 says this, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, the word of God, and in his word he meditates or imagines day and night. Same word as Joshua 1.8, same word as Psalm 2 verse 1, is this word meditate in Psalm 1 verses 1 and 2. So, if you're struggling with the mental images that you have about your life, the way that you change your imagination is to meditate on or imagine God's Word. Now, in his book, Visioneering, Pastor Andy Stanley says this, Everybody ends up somewhere in life. You can end up somewhere on purpose. You can end up with your life being lived out in line with the Word of God. And so as we have talked about the power of thought, I never want us to underestimate the next level and the power of imagination in our lives. Imagine your life being lived out according to the Word of God. I'm not saying we're perfect we're heading in that direction (laughs) and we're getting better and better all the time. But what I am saying is see your life being lived out. God says that we need to be generous. See your life being lived out as a generous person. The Bible says that we are the healed of the Lord. See your life being lived out as the healed of the Lord. Don't see yourself being fearful of sickness and disease. 
No, the Bible says that we have God's favor upon us. See your life being lived out as you have the favor of God on you. When, when you need something to happen on your job or for a promotion or whatever the case might be, believe God that you have God's favor on you. Well, somebody says, but what if it doesn't happen, Pastor? Well, guess what? That just means God has something better for you. Don't let go of that vision and that dream. Hang on to that and get it down on the inside of you. You know, if you have problems with people in your life that there's strife, fussing and so forth, see your life being lived out as a forgiver. See your life being lived out as a person of love, that you love people unconditionally. See your life being lived out as a person of grace and mercy. And as you get that thing, uh, you begin to think about it and you begin to see it and see your life being lived out that way, begin, and you're talking about it, get that down in your heart. And I promise you, the soil of your heart in cooperation with the help of God, the power of God, will begin to work to cause that to come to pass in your life, in Jesus' name. Do you receive that today? I know you do. I wanna pray for you today, and I believe there might be some people watching this today that you're struggling with that mental picture, that thinking that needs to be changed. I'm going to ask the Lord to help you through the Word of God and through the Holy Spirit to begin to minister to us and help us change those images. Father, I pray for the people today. Father, I thank you, Lord, for the power of your Word and what your Word produces in our lives. Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus for the ability that you have given us to not only think thoughts, but to think pictures. Help us, Father, to orient our thinking to the Word of God and let the Word of God go to work to change what we see in our lives. And Father, I thank you for it. I believe you to do it in the hearts and the lives of the people. And I praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I never like to dismiss our time and end our service without giving someone an opportunity to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life. Why not do that today? You know, if you don't have a relationship with God and somebody says, well, how do I know? Well, let me ask you a question. If your heart was to stop beating a few moments from now, God forbid, do you know where you would spend eternity? Would you spend it in heaven with God? Or would you spend an eternity separated from God in hell? Well, it's not God's will that anybody perish, the Bible says, or, or spend an eternity in hell. Jesus came and paid a great price so that we could be forgiven and we could spend an eternity with God in heaven. I want to invite you to open your heart today to receive what Jesus has done for each and every one of us. Listen, God loves you. You know the old scripture that we all probably have heard quoted before, John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. I want you to experience that today. I'm not asking you to necessarily join our church or find religion. No, I'm asking you to open your heart and receive what Jesus did for you and for me in purchasing our salvation some 2,000 years ago. And, and it's not hard. Jesus did the work for us. Our part is just simply receive what he's done, believe it in our heart, and say it with our mouths. And if you've given your heart to Christ at some point, but your heart's grown cold towards the things of God, I want to invite you to come back home. God's not mad at you. He's madly in love with each and every one of us, and He's pursuing after you right now. He wants you, and He wants you to come back home. So turn your heart back towards Him. Somebody says, how do I do it? Well, again, just open your heart to Him, and I want to lead you in a simple prayer today so that you can give your heart to Christ for the first time, or you can recommit your life to the Lord. 
Would you pray with me today? Just say this, Heavenly Father, I come to you in Jesus' name. I need a Savior. And Lord Jesus, I believe with all my heart that you died for me. And I believe with all my heart that you were raised from the dead. Jesus, come into my heart. I make you my Lord and Savior. Wash me in your blood. Make me clean and holy. Forgive me of my past and give me a brand new start. Now fill me to the full and overflowing with the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, thank you that I'm forgiven. Thank you for a brand new life and a new beginning. Amen. Now listen, if you prayed that prayer with me, we are so proud of you and I want you to know something. Jesus said in John the 15th chapter that when one sinner repents, the angels rejoice. And if you prayed that prayer with me today and you either gave your heart to Christ for the first time or you recommitted your life to the Lord, listen, the angels are having a party. They're celebrating right now because of you and the decision that you made to open your heart to what the Lord Jesus has done for each and every one of us. And we love you and we're celebrating with you and we want to cheer you on. And I want to ask you to do a couple of things. First thing is if you prayed that prayer with me and you gave your heart to Christ, either for the first time or you recommitted your life to the Lord, would you do me a favor and let us know? Would you send an email to my story at springhill.cc and just say, I prayed that prayer with Brad today. I gave my heart to Christ or I recommitted my life to the Lord. And listen, we're not going to harass you. We just want to celebrate with you. We want to pray for you and believe that God has good things in store for you and, and you're on the road to victory because of the decision that you made today. The second thing I want to ask you to do is this. If you're not in the Charlotte area, wherever you are, whatever city you happen to be in, I want to ask you, go get in a good Bible-based, Bible-teaching church there in your area with people that believe and, and fellowship just like you and, and get in there and be a part of that church fellowship. You need that in order to grow spiritually. If you are in the Charlotte area, listen, there's tons of great churches here in Charlotte or the surrounding communities, Rock Hill and others. Listen, get in a good church in our area. If you, if you don't know of one, just come and be a part of our church. You know, we're online right now, but we'd love to have you connect with us and be a part of our church. And so we love you and we celebrate with you. And we want you to get exactly where God wants you to be. And that is growing in him and becoming everything that he's called you to be. But we, God bless you. We love you so much in Jesus' name. Hey, Spring Hill family, I love you and I praise God for you. I pray for you all the time and I believe God to do great things in your life. Now, before we leave today, I want to just take a moment. Let's give to the Lord. You guys are absolutely awesome. You're faithful to obey the Word of God. I am so grateful for you and grateful for your uh, diligence and obedience to honor God in your tithes and giving of offerings. And I appreciate that. And I know God does too. And so as you do that, God promised a couple of things. He promised that he would open the windows of heaven, pour out blessing into your life. He promised that he would receive the gifts, the offerings that we give to, the, to him and multiply them and return them back to us and meet our needs so that we're in a position to meet the needs of other people. And so I want that for you. I want you to receive all the goodness that God has in store for you. And listen, lack and insufficiency is not of God. God wants you to be fully supplied with all of your needs met so that you can be a blessing to other people. And so I thank God for you. And I thank God for what he's doing in our church. You know, as I mentioned to you last week, we sent the last payments in on a couple of notes. We've got uh, some things that uh, a note, another note loan that will be paid off this month. We've got 
uh, $750 roughly left on that. So we're going to be paying that off this month. And uh, so I thank God for you. And I thank God for what you're allowing us or helping us to be able to do to continue to preach the word of God, teach the word of God and, and minister to people and help people. And uh, listen, God is, is moving and in Jesus name, now I'm not making an announcement, I'm saying this by faith, we have a new building, we have a place to meet in Jesus name and uh, I, I want you to stay in faith with us as we continue to trust God and believe God for the right place, for the right amount of money that will enable us to be able to do everything that God's called us to do. And so stay in faith, believe God with us. And I know he's gonna, he's gonna come through and give us the very best thing that we can use in order to do what we do as a church family. But I love you so much. Thank you for your giving. Let me pray for you as you give today. Father, I thank you for the giving of the people. I thank you, Lord, for blessing them. I thank you, Father, for ministering and meeting every need of every household. Father, I thank you for bringing increase to your people. I thank you, Lord, that you're not El Chipo, you're El Shaddai, the one who is more than enough. And Father, we believe you to do it. Father, I thank you every need of Spring Hill Church is met. Thank you, Lord. We call ourselves out of debt. Every vendor is satisfied. Every bill is paid. And we have more than enough to do everything you've called us to do. We thank you for it. And we give you praise for it all. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Uh, listen, I want to remind you. Um, join us on Wednesday nights for Wednesday night Bible study. Man, I'd love to. We do it on the Zoom platform, and I'd love to have as many people on there as we possibly can. The, our capacity right now with the plan that we have on Zoom is 100 people, and I'd love to max that out at Bible study. So listen, join with us. Every Wednesday night, 7 p.m., we'll be uh, online ministering and teaching the Word of God for about an hour. And, uh, you know, we fellowship with one another. We get to see each other and say hi and all of that. And we spend time in the Word of God. And I believe it will be a blessing to you. So invest that hour of your life into Wednesday night Bible study and join us. Anybody's welcome to join us and be a part of that. And the way you do is go to our homepage at springhill.cc and there will be a link there where you can click and join us on the Zoom platform. You might have to install Zoom or, or log in on your web, your browser, but you can come and be a part of Bible study and, and enjoy that time with us. And uh, as we spend time in the, in the presence of God. So join with us. We'd love to have you be a part of that. But listen, we love you so much. I believe you are getting ready to have the best week of your life coming up this week. Do you receive that today? I do. Man, I'm looking forward to a great week this week. I know God has good things in store for us. And, and listen, the Bible says that he is longing to be good to those who are looking for his goodness. And I'm looking for the goodness of God. And I want you to do that too. God surely loves you and we love you. And I believe you're getting ready to have the best week of your life coming up this week. But listen, I want to declare a blessing over you before you go. Father, I declare in the name of Jesus over these, your precious people, that Father, they are blessed of heaven. I declare that your favor rests upon them. I declare, Father, that they are strong in the Lord and in the power of your might. Father, I declare that they are filled with wisdom, creativity, supernatural ability, and that Father, in Jesus' name, they are well able to do everything that you've called them to do in the name of Jesus. Father, I declare that no weapon formed against them shall prosper, that in Jesus' name, every plan, every operation of the enemy against them is stopped and stilled. I declare that they are the healed of the Lord in Jesus' name. They are healed from the tops of their heads to the soles of their feet. And Father, I thank you that and no matter where we go, you give your angels charge over us to keep us and to protect us and keep us safe in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for our church building and thank you, Lord, for the best week of our lives coming up this week. We love you, Lord, 
and give you praise for it all in Jesus name. Amen and amen. Hey, listen, listen to me carefully. Something good is going to happen to you this week in Jesus name. I love you. God bless you. We'll see you next time.